There we go. I'm up here. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, folks. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us again for another stream here on the Machine Learning Community Stand Up. Uh, I am your host, Luis, and with me are my co-hosts, Bree and Jake. Now, uh, last stream, we sort of talked about the deep learning plan for uh, .NET in general and specifically as it, you know, uh, sort of uh, relates to ML.NET. Um, and part of that plan is integrating a little bit with or actually a large part of it is integrating with PyTorch, uh, the PyTorch set of libraries. And in the .NET space, you have libraries like Torch Sharp. So to talk to us about that, we're gonna have Nicholas uh, tell us more about it. Um, Nicholas, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself before we get into the discussion? Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Nicholas Gustafson. I've uh, been uh, at Microsoft for 19 years in the developer division all the time. I've been working on a number of various things. Um, uh, concurrency runtime. Uh, I've been involved in some C sharp things. I've been uh, working on uh, AI uh, tooling and machine learning tooling for the last several years. I was involved with ML.NET uh, when it, when we first started looking at it, um, bringing this internal thing out. Uh, I've been uh, spending a, a bunch of time lately on uh, Torch Sharp, which is um, what we're going to talk about today. Um, I didn't start it, but I've been doing um, a lot of work on it uh, lately. And um, we have some sort of interesting and exciting news about it. And uh, we'll do a walkthrough of some code and, and just look at its architecture and such. Awesome. Yeah, we're really looking forward to that. But before we get into the discussion and we get to see some code, uh, let's get into some community links. To the screen here. That. Whoops. It's the first time doing it. Uh, okay. So uh, for the community links, uh, let me just pull up the banner here. Um, you can go to the URL list, which is a usual link, and then it's the MLNet stand up with today's date. And that's how you can get access to all these really awesome community links that we have here. Um, let me start off with this one here. Uh, which is goody or baddie. Now, on the previous stream, we talked about it a little bit, um, and essentially it was this application, uh, or 
that train I think your audio cut out Luis yeah yeah no it is yeah for for some reason I'm, I'm getting an echo sorry I'm getting an audio feedback uh, sorry about that. So uh, Goody or Batty is this application that essentially used uh, train an image classification model to determine whether these cartoon characters were good or bad. Uh, now, before I, the post that we shared last time, I think it was just in this initial phase. Oh, did it? Oh, sorry. Um, we can hear you now, Luis. Yeah, um, can you folks hear me now? Yep. Yeah, okay. So uh, essentially uh, what's going on here is uh, now that it has a UI that allows you to basically select some sort of cartoon character or you could drop the image file here and it's gonna tell you whether that character is good or bad, all right? Um, so so yeah, make sure to check this, this one out. Um, for our, I believe this is in French, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but we have this tutorial that walks through how you can build a uh, binary classification model for, uh, I believe it's for reviewing films. So whether it's a positive or whether it's a negative review uh, of, you know, of the, a particular film. So this tutorial basically walks users through how you could essentially do that. Um, we also have this other presentation from the Orlando.net user group. And in it, Veronica uh, went ahead and, you know, just did a walkthrough of uh, how you can use machine learning in your .NET applications, and and part of that, you know, involves uh, using uh, tools like and, and libraries like ML.NET. There's this other one here, this other link here uh, that that shows us um, this new announcement from the FS Lab org. So they have, you know, it's another banger from them. They've been doing a lot of really great work. Uh, they've been working on things like Plotly.NET, which is this uh, sort of the .NET uh, version of the Plotly library for, for visualizations, All right? So with this one, uh, they're announcing that there's a new version coming of our provider. So if you're not familiar with our provider, the FS Lab org in general, FS Lab is basically this collection of, of libraries and packages that gets maintained by the community. Uh, and it's specific to data science and, and machine learning workload. So we, I believe uh, in our early days of this stream, we had the folks from F Sharp Stats come on and that's part of the FS Lab org, right? Um, now in this case, that same organization, the FS Lab Org, uh, is essentially announcing that there is a an R provider coming out, and what this is going to allow you to do, um, just like its previous version, there's actually an existing version out there, it just hasn't been sort of maintained and, and updated, allows you to interop uh, between R and F Sharp. So R, if if you're not familiar, is this very popular uh, sort of language for uh, doing statistics, statistical type of workloads, and performing analytics, analytics type workloads, right? Um, so if you would like to use that within a .NET environment, this R provider sort of provides that, that interoperability between both ecosystems, all right? So it's, it's a really nice way to, um, to essentially work with R and be able to access some of those libraries that, that folks really like the, tidy, the tidyverse set of libraries, right? That folks, uh, particularly data scientists, are very familiar with, with working. And it seems like uh, the, the new maintainer is Andrew Martin here. So it's super exciting, really looking forward to, to sort of what comes out of that. In sort of more general news here, um, the Dynet Foundation uh, is having elections. So um, I believe you have to be a, a voting member, meaning that you, uh, I think you have to join the foundation, but essentially I believe it's until the 20th of, of the month, September 20th, um, there's gonna be elections for a new board. So if you know, you're part of the Dynet Foundation, just FYI, the elections are undergoing. You can take a look at who the candidates are um, and go ahead and cast your vote. In terms of learning, if you like to learn more sort of like general concepts about data science and, and machine learning, um, there is this uh, sort of series of episodes that are going to be happening by uh, from from the sort of Learn Live team, um, and it's going to dive into the foundations of data science for machine learning. So again, this is not specific to .NET, but it is more if you're interested in learning again the the, the fundamentals of machine learning. Um, 
the software that's used, the techniques, um, you know, the algorithms, the transforms, all sorts of things. You can take a look at what the schedule looks like, um, and essentially, uh, you know, go go through it and, and sign up to to sort of go through this series, right? And it's going to be taking place. Uh, actually, I believe the first one was yesterday. Uh, you can watch it here. Uh, and there's a few more coming. I believe they're happening every week um, for the next month or two. So make sure to check that out if you're interested in, again, learning about more of the fundamentals of machine learning. Now, speaking of learning and fundamentals and concepts, uh, I'm going to sort of switch over to our uh, segment here. And uh, today's episode or stream is brought to you by the letter C. And something that starts with the letter C is cross-validation. Technically, it's two words, but let's let's assume that it's one. Um, so, so cross-validation is this technique, and and there's actually you know you can sort of go into into there's different variations of cross-validation, but I'm going to keep it <laughs> I'm going to keep it very simple here, and just talk overall about the term. Um, now, in this guide here, there's not really any visual, so I'm I'm going to start off with a picture because pictures are really nice for explaining these sort of concepts. So typically, when you train machine learning models, um, you go ahead and you take a data set, you split it into training, your training and test set, maybe a training validation and test set, and you go ahead and train a single model on that data. Now, uh, sometimes what may happen there is that you run the risk of overfitting, right? Meaning, and, and overfitting is just another concept. Maybe when we'll get to the letter O, we can talk about overfitting. But uh, overfitting is this concept where your, your model performs really well on the training set. When you evaluate it against training data, it performs really well and is able to basically almost like memorize what the answers are, right? And that's not something that you want. What you want from your model typically is that you want it to generalize well. You want it to perform well on unseen data, right? Now, when you just have train a single model and when you just train it on this the same test data set, you run the risk of overfitting. And that's kind of where, where cross-validation comes in. And the way that cross-validation works is you're still doing those splits. However, you're training multiple models. So in this case, let's let's assume that we're splitting into five different partitions. Um, the first model would sort of have this partition as your test set that you're going to evaluate how well your model performs on. And it's going to use the rest of your data as your training set. For your second model, it's going to use this partition as your test set and the rest as a training set. So you get a little bit more variety in the examples that your data set is looking at. And hopefully, you can build a, a, a model that is a little bit more representative and it, it's better uh, at generalizing right, and, and making predictions on unseen data. Um, so, so this technique is something that you would use to, again, combat that sort of overfitting uh, risk. Um, and it's also really good if you have a relatively small data set. So let's say that this full data set, maybe you didn't have enough data or not in, you didn't have a lot of data to provide both a training and a test set. Well, cross-validation might be able to help you with that because now you have multiple test sets to choose from and you're able to use your whole data set, which, which will allow you to, to have a uh, sort of representative represent representative um, sort of uh, view of your, of your data set, right? Um, there are some drawbacks to this because you're not training a single model, you're training multiple models, right? Uh, it's gonna take longer to train. Right, so so that is something that you want to sort of keep in mind. That uh, you want to make sure that that you know that you're aware of that. That it's going to take longer to train because now you're you're looking at different models. So with the concept sort of out of the way, um, let me kind of go back to this guide here, which is going to sh which shows you how you can use cross validation in ML.NET. All right, so if you imagine that you had this this data set here, it's basically just providing you. Uh, uh, sort of historical prices, and, and you're trying to predict housing prices here, right? You could model the schema this way, and you load this into an iData view. Um, at that form, at that point, you essentially perform your data transformations just like you normally would. Um, and where cross validation comes in is right here. There's this cross validate sort of uh, uh, estimator or, or transform here, um, where you provide your pre processed data the algorithm that you're gonna to use to train the different models and the number of folds. So this folds here is the number of partitions that you're splitting your data set into, right? And what's gonna happen here is, as I mentioned, your data set is gonna be partitioned, depend, you know, based on the number of folds that you've sort of specified. Uh, it's gonna train a model on each of those partitions and evaluate against the test set. Uh, and then it's gonna run an evaluation to try to determine how well does each of these models perform. At that point, you can essentially take a look at the R squared metrics. You can 
now in this case it's r squared because the example we're using here is regression but of course you can do this for classification and other uh, scenarios as well or other tasks um, so in this case we're looking at the r squared so we can just extract that along with other metrics all right because we're just looking at the result here of our of our evaluation for each of the models and if we want to select what the best model was there we can just use link here all right and order our, our sort of uh, our models uh, based on whatever metric it is that that's important to us and just extract the model that way right and, and get the model that way so uh, if you're you know you don't have a lot of data you want to maybe combat overfitting you should consider uh, using something like cross validation for training your machine learning models be aware again that it's going to take a little bit longer and if you want to know how to do an ml.net make sure to check out this guide here one thing to um, add is another way to do now, cross -validation. That i want to kind of point uh, sort of your attention to is uh, there's been a few updates that have been happening on the doc side of things. If you'd like to keep up with what's happening in docs, there is this what's new page that the .NET team sort of compiles. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, different topics uh, that have been updated. But the one specific or that may be of interest to you is ML.NET. So in the month of August, you can see that there were a few, there's actually a few more. Um, I'm not sure why they're not showing up here, but Essentially, if you want to get what's been updated, what's new uh, in terms of documentation, uh, you can definitely go to this site here uh, and check it out here. And that's that's going to give you basically the the some of the top updates. And if we uh, if we take a look at the community contributors, no surprise there, uh, John Wood is is just uh, you know uh, he's 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 been doing working you know really diligently and and doing really great work, making sure that the docs are updated and that you folks uh, you know are able to use uh, ML.NET. All right, so with that, um, so with that, let me go ahead and um, switch over to Nicholas here and switch over to the screen here. Luis, can you hear us still? <laughs> yeah. Cool. I was just going to add one more thing to the cross validation. One other way to do cross validation uh, is to just use Model Builder. So we do cross validation depending on on your sample, like how many samples you have in your data sets. Um, I think it's we have some threshold. I think it's ten thousand. I'd have to double check, but if you have less than ten thousand, we do um, we do cross validation. If you have more than ten thousand, we just do a test train split and rely just on that. So. Although it's it's fun to learn, hopefully we we make it really easy to do, and you don't even need to know about it if you use if you use Model Builder. Yeah, uh, and apologies for that. For whatever reason, there was a one of the tabs that was open had the stream going, so I I was listening to myself talk, and it was delayed. So uh, yeah, so that's kind of what was going on, and why I just took the headphones off. But we're good now. Sounds good. Thanks, Luis. All right, so uh, let, let me switch over here to Nicholas, who's going to talk to us a little bit about um, TorchArt. All right. All right, thank you, Luis. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yep. Perfect. Yes, we can. Um, all right, so um, an introduction to TorchArt. I'm, um, I introduced myself a little bit earlier, but I'm a PM architect at Microsoft. I've been in DevDev for almost, nine, well, a little bit over 19 years worked on a variety of things, most of them centering around .NET, but not everything. Um, so TorchSharp is a project that was started actually quite a quite a while ago, I think about three years ago. I uh, lay dormant for a while. Don Syme used it for uh, an F-Sharp, as the foundation for an F-Sharp library where he needed a, a good tensor implementation. But um, until about six months ago, there wasn't a lot of the um, modules, uh, what what Pyth you know PyTorch calls modules, uh, implemented. It was mostly the tensor library that was, and so <coughs> I picked it up and started working on it um, a while ago. And now it's not completely complete, <laughs> but it's uh, largely complete and and mostly usable. Um, I would say. So let's. This is going to be a, a little bit of an intro to it, a uh, discussion about some style choices that we made, and then I'm mostly going to share uh, code with you and show you code and, and hopefully sort of give you a sense of how it's what it's like to use through uh, looking at code. Um, and so Nicholas, before you 
before you start, do you mind just hiding that uh, notification right there? Um, it might get in the way of some of your code. Do you, do you see that? Um, Which notification? Yeah, uh, it's on the bottom center that says the stop sharing if you hide it. Oh, hide it here. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Right. <laughs> um, all right, very good. So it's so Torchstrap is a general deep learning framework, uh, and it's free of Python dependency. I think it's important to understand that um, this is not sitting on top of Python. So this is a, a dot. It's a dot .NET uh, library entirely. We started under the Xamarin umbrella, um, and we're right now in the process of moving to the .NET Foundation. It was approved as a .NET Foundation project, um, where uh, the repo on GitHub is under .NET, not under Xamarin anymore. Um, and the next release, uh, which will be the first one uh, under .NET Foundation will be uh, 0 0.92. Uh, we have been on NuGet for quite a while. Um, so you will find Torch Sharp on NuGet, in the NuGet gallery right now. It'll be 91. And it's actually a couple of months dated in terms of the APIs compared to what you will find in the repo. Um, the thing that is holding us up right now is we're waiting for a cert uh, that will allow us to sign binaries. Uh, we're not going to release anything under .NET Foundation without having signed binaries. Uh, and so we're just waiting for that. And we'll have, within the next couple of weeks, we'll probably be releasing uh, 92. The uh, structure is, so, so if you're familiar with PyTorch, and you know if you're not, here's a picture of what it looks like. PyTorch is a relatively thin Python layer, and I'll qualify that a little bit in a, in a while. Um, relatively thin Python layer on top of uh, a largely native implementation of tensors and operations on tensors, tensors being multidimensional arrays. Um, and it's supported on a variety of platforms, primarily um, non-mobile platforms there's it there is some support on on mobile platforms too but it's it the large user base is on pcs and servers and, and such um libtorch.so dll and dilib they're all just the implementation on linux on windows and on mac os <coughs> there are two two widely used uh, backends. One is for CPUs and one is for NVIDIA processors via CUDA. There's also support for uh, Google's TPUs, uh, support for um, XLA, which is you know a, another Google technology based on TensorFlow as a backend. But um, we have not tested TorchSharp with anything except those dark blue um, backends, CPU and CUDA. I don't know the state of uh, the PyTorch, you know, if there's a what PyTorch uh, status in terms of getting to AMD uh, GPUs is uh, at this point. Be before we go further, there's actually a question here from the chat from Fuel yeah. Snabel. You mentioned that um, part of what, what sort of this library provides you with is uh, tensor implementations. So yes. what's the difference between a tensor and a matrix? So, so there, uh, we'll see some. We'll see some code uh, mm -hmm. uh, that may show some of that. But I would say that, technically speaking, a tensor is a is a mathematically speaking a vector is a, is one dimension or one. Well, a vector rep represents a number of dimensions. But if we think in terms of the vector itself, a vector is a uh, one dimension, matrix is two dimensions, and tensors are generalizations, so n dimensions. Um, so in other words, a matrix is a two-dimensional tensor. Uh, a vector is a one-dimensional tensor, uh, mathematically speaking. Uh, so that's kind of the definition. Otherwise, they're, they're very much, I mean, it's very much the same. I hope that Thanks. Thanks. explains the, the distinction. Yeah. Thank you. One is a generalization of the other. Oh, yes. And so here I just want to emphasize again that TorchSharp sits on top of the native libraries for Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. There is no Python interop involved here. There is another library, torch.net, uh, that does go via Python interop. 
um, that is also uh, available. Uh, we chose to go the native route with this particular library. So I want to right away uh, bring up and take questions and arguments and and uh, you know feedback on uh, what we felt and knew was a very controversial design decision. We made the high order bit to ease the transposing of code from Python to .NET. Um, sort of a, a first design principle. So what does that mean? That means that we will not necessarily adhere to .NET typical traditional .NET style guidelines. Um, <clears throat> so for example, if we look at two identical pieces of code, one in Python and one in .NET, and this is from the Torch Vision library. I'm bringing this up because it actually shows Torch Vision is written in Python, uh, not in uh, C++. And so there's actual substantial amount of numerical code in it. Um, if you look at this code, you'll see that, except for the declaration pieces, and I, I apologize for showing Python without uh, syntax highlighting. I, when I copied it, um, I, it just didn't come along. But we see that there's very, uh, very similar code. In fact, when I do a lot of, you know, movement of code from Python to C plus to to C sharp, I can often do very very minimal edits to it. I have to put the var in, in front of the uh, variable declaration. I have to, you know, change how <clears throat> how array literals uh, look, and I have to change uh, the uh, named argument syntax a little bit, changing from an equal sign to a colon. But apart from that, I can often just cut and paste code, and this is a productivity feature, we see it as, not a bug. Um, you can look, you, if you look at the .NET code, it looks very, very little like .NET. There's like lowercase everywhere. We are using, and I'll, I'll show you later, we're using, um, not we're not relying on constructors, but on factory methods in a lot of places. And we are also, and, and this goes to the next page here, we're not completely, we're not doing the typical .NET thing in terms of static typing, and specifically not with tensors. So a tensor is a multi-dimensional vector or array of booleans or numbers. Um, TensorFlows ha also has tensors of strings. Uh, pipe, you know, LibTorch does not offer that. Um, but we're, we're not, doing in, in the .NET representation of tensors, we're not doing tensor of T. So we're not doing tensor of float, tensor of double, tensor of int, tensor of Boolean. We're just doing tensor. And the element type is kept inside the tensor itself. It can't be changed once you have a tensor instance, but it's not exposed in the static type of the tensor. And that is um, for the same reason that we chose to deviate from um, from .NET style guidelines uh, that it eases the, the uh, porting of code from Python to .NET, which is a kind of unusual choice in that every language has its own aesthetics. It has its own sort of op opinion on what it should be, what it code should look like. And <clears throat> this is more Pythonic than uh, C sharp like or .NET like, but there is such a overwhelming wealth of examples and textbooks and documentation and and uh, tutorials and educational materials on PyTorch that we will have that serve as an excellent starting point and making the effort involved in taking and leveraging that body of documentation and examples in learning and, and transposing, if you will, to .NET was a choice we made after long deliberation and, and we think still think it's the right one. It doesn't necessarily look like .NET code, 
but it does uh, look like the examples and the, the things you will find on Stack Overflow or PyTorch.org, et cetera, et cetera. So if I'm sounding defensive, it's probably because I am. I, I think it's something that's very controversial and should be controversial. Um, and it took us a while to arrive at it, but um, it we, we do think it was the right choice. Yeah. So before we jump into the, the demo, Nicholas, we do have some comments. It, I wouldn't say that they're necessarily arguing, but they are kind of adjusting some of the, I think, the, the counterpoints. Um, I guess I, I've actually never used the interface to pull up the comments, but uh, Fuel Snabel asked, uh, you know, why is it controversial? And I think you, you covered that uh, for the most part, but I also, um, I guess, kind of want to point out Fraggle Rock uh, did, did comment on it, saying it, it looks weird. Um, yeah. And then also said, you know, unsure if optimizing for copy and paste encoding is really sensible. And um, I think you kind of touched on this already since there, but I just kind of wanted to reiterate that, you know, it's not just for copying and pasting, right? It's for being yeah. able to leverage the wealth of like documentation and examples and everything out there. And, you know, it's not having to recreate it just to have the .NET code version of it, uh, right? like making it easy to adapt. Yeah, it, I, I agree, and I, and I and I probably so so. First of all, I think that the the, the first uh, question: Why is it controversial? It is controversial because it it violates .NET style guides. That's why it's controversial. Um, and and I I was very much myself uh, sort of. Well, we we deliberated for a long time, months on this. Um, Don Simon and I mostly um, copy and paste. I, I mentioned that in the in the context of, of moving code over, and I, I think I inelegantly made it sound like that was the purpose, is to be able to copy and paste. I think it is about the real thing is not about copy and paste. It's about discoverability and being able to see what the um, interface um, really looks like from the documentation and samples, et cetera. And so learning and being able to move that learning over, uh, I think is the is the thing we're trying to optimize for, not necessarily copy and paste. If, if it works every now and then by copying and paste, well, good, but it's not actually sort of the main, that's a means to an end, not, a, not the end itself. I'll, I'll sort of provide an example, I guess, for, uh, at Ben, I, I'm just speaking personally here, um, but another example where you kind of see this, though it's it's still very .NET like, is .NET for Apache Spark. Um, the .NET for Apache Spark API still sort of you know is true to a lot of the .NET style guides and conventions, but the naming of sort of the the transforms and the different operations uh, are very similar to the Spark and and you know sort of uh, uh, PySpark uh, set of transforms. So if you were to look up you know, how do I filter this particular thing? You're going to see Scala code, right, for 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 Spark, but it's it's so similar to the .NET API that you can basically copy and paste, right, and then just modify it to be more .NET like. But but again, going back to those doc, that documentation, those samples that there's, you know, Spark has been around for years. Um, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Um, you know, when when you have all these examples that, yeah, you might have to tweak things here and there, but for the most part, they look fairly similar. Yeah. Got another <clears throat> so there are. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Nicholas. Uh, just a, another question um, kind of around the same thing. Um, uh, Sheriff Houdin asked, C-sharp is a static type language and Python is dynamic language. How how are you going to manage all, how is it managing all of the data types or memory management or garbage collection? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, what what specifically so so <clears throat> underneath the covers is c plus plus which is um just as static as c sharp um what what the libtorch implementation does and what is which is the same as we do in in c sharp is we have static types and you one of the things that you can do in in python is you can actually modify the shape and and I would say behavioral type of a um, of an object after it's been created. Uh, 
that's uh, to me at least when I look at dynamic languages if you it's not fully dynamic unless you can do that um, and you you cannot do that with Torchor um, you can convert things and you can uh, what but that means creating a new object so what when I say we're not quite using static typing I mean it's the element type it, it's <clears throat> it's limited that statement is limited to the our choice not to expose the element type of a tensor in the type of the tensor um, but elsewhere and and we can look at some code we're using we're relying on static typing in um, for example our methods uh, method declaration so we're relying on <clears throat> in factory methods as such we're relying on static typing where Python would just sort of take arguments of dynamic type and figure out what they are afterwards. So we're doing, we're relying on overloading where Python doesn't have overloading and doesn't obviously doesn't rely on it. Um, so, so we are statically typed, I would say, except for the tensor type where it's half static, if you will. There are some areas where um, uh, we discovered this, uh, there are some methods that I yet don't know how to implement in uh, C Sharp, where you actually go and modify the members of the class, the Python class. Um, and that's just not something you can do in .NET. Um, and, and, uh, but it's a very, it's just, it's less, less than a handful of methods that will be, we'll have to figure something else out. Uh, before digging into the code, maybe we can answer this uh, one last question and then we'll get back to more questions after. But uh, Jose asked, what's the relation between the Torch Sharp, Sci Sharp, and MLNet? So, what, what was the middle one, Sci Sharp? Yep. Yeah, so we have, we have, um, let me, let me talk about that one first. We have borrowed the idea of using Python-like uh, style in our APIs from C Sharp. That, that both their uh, num, num sharp, uh, you know, their NumPy uh, numerical library, uh, tensorflow.net, um, they both follow the, the idea of we should make it look as much like Python as possible because that's where the samples, that's where the documentation, that's where the tutorials, are um, and so we have borrowed that from SciSharp. We are um, not yet in any meaningful way integrated with uh, ML.NET, so the relationship is not uh, clear there. We are uh, thinking about and and looking at how to best implement, sort of to integrate. I shouldn't say implement integrate. Uh, Torch Sharp with ML.NET. Right now, ML.NET for its deep learning needs relies on TensorFlow.net, and and those particular the scenarios that we have in ML.NET for deep learning are served well by TensorFlow.net. Um, there, and and we're not necessarily looking to replace TensorFlow.net. We're looking to, you know, add a second framework to ML.NET, um, and that is yet to be completely. Uh, hashed out. I want to I will re reiterate that Torch Sharp is yet not at 1.0. So it's not uh, quite ready for the type of uh, product quality that ML.NET represents. And so we're still holding off on that integration. One thing I wanted to add to that is, um, you know, although we we have that that design idea of making it easy to, you know, port Python to the .NET version for TorchSharp, you know, we don't really have a similar thing with ML.NET. So as we start looking at our integrations for ML.NET, that likely will be, you know, it'll look and feel like .NET. That's the layer where we're going to try and make, you know, deep learning, you know, feel like .NET and native to .NET. So we'll yeah. we'll keep working with with you know the community and see how we want to shape that. Um, that and, and that's an excellent that's an excellent point, Jake. And and thank you for bringing that up. If you look at the PyTorch code. Uh, and, and also, if you look at the, the Torch Sharp code in, in a bit here, 
one of the things that you will note is that it's actually fairly low level. Um, for example, a lot of a lot of uh, machine learning APIs has a you know you build your model and then you say fit, and then it comes back with a trained model. PyTorch doesn't have anything like that, and and neither does Torch Sharp. There is, however, libraries that are built on top of PyTorch, kind of like Keras is built on top of TensorFlow, or it was. It's now integrated with TensorFlow. But uh, for example, FastAI has this higher level abstraction um, approach, and which is kind of part of the inspiration also for some of the deep learning support in ML.NET currently, that we want to raise the abstraction level and just say, hey, here's a model. Here's, you know, we'll take care of the, e tr the training part you just call fit or something like that. That layer, I would imagine we would, uh, where there's really no Python code to, to copy or move or learn from, et cetera, it's going to be a whole new a API. In that scenario, I imagine that we will uh, be have much more leeway to uh, follow .NET uh, style. Yeah, and, and I don't know if Keras still does that, but I remember in its early days before it was integrated uh, with TensorFlow, right? You always had the choice of the back end. You could even choose, I believe, CNTK at some point mm -hmm. uh, uh, for Keras. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Very long time. <laughs> but uh, but yes, yeah, so you had that choice, right? Where you had Keras as this top layer, but then whatever you were using in the back end, you know, uh, so, you know, translate that to say TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, sorry, TorchSharp, um, you know, whatever, right? Uh, you know, something uh, having that layer to sort of abstract that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, are there Brie? Are there more questions that I should I uh, uh, tackle here there's, before we we move on? About, let's start looking at the code, and then we can come back to more questions. Okay, excellent. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna uh, I've cho chosen a couple of things to to look at. I want to demonstrate a few things in terms of, and I'm just gonna bring this up in Visual Studio. I hope everybody can see um, that if I made the uh, the font too small, um, please let me know in the in the comment field. But is the Visual Studio thing on top here for everybody? Um, yep. OK. So one of the things you'll see in the code is that there's a lot of use of static classes. Um, and that's. To, that's another one of these style Python-like style things, is so that we can have these factory methods and make it look um, more like Python, avoid the news. Um, and so that's something that also is was going to stand out as as not very .NET-y. Anyway, I want to highlight that. Um, one of the things that this is the code I was showing earlier. Essentially, we have. <coughs> When you when you write Python or PyTorch code, and when you write Torch Sharp code, also it looks a lot like math, right? Um, these are all operating. All the inputs here are tensors. These are all operating on tensors. You can, um, for example, you can you can't really do an if then else based on tensors because if then if expects to see a single value, like a single Boolean, and decide on one path over the other. So, But you can do things like you can compare tensors. And what you get out of that is a tensor, a Boolean tensor, of exactly the same shape. And that one can then be used uh, to mask uh, results uh, later on, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, the, the code looks very math-like. And it is very math-like, but it's all operating on element-wise so spreading the operations on all the various um, elements of the tensors. Torch Sharp supports the same. You know the the idea. This is a this is a um, uh, an important aspect of uh, being able to do tensor math is that sometimes you uh, don't have um, two tensors that you need to operate on. You have a tensor and a scalar. So for example, down here. We have H, which is a tensor, and we have the number six. So we're dividing. This is called broadcasting. You're broadcasting the value six across all the elements of H. We're broadcasting rather the operation of dividing by six across all the elements of H. So 
uh, that's supported, but it looks very much just like normal code. There's no hint here that there's a deep learning library underneath the covers. And this is when we say that uh, it was used as just a tensor library for, you know, for some F sharp purposes. Uh, this is the kind of things that you would see in that type of code. There's no training or anything like that involved here. So this is from the vision, uh, the, the vision library where uh, and we'll see a use of that in, in just a moment, uh, where in actually in the Python case, it's not just a thin layer on top of C++ code, it's actually a substantial amount of code written in Python, and it's used mostly for pre-processing images. Um, we'll look at a, I'll, I'll look first at a, at a simple, a fairly simple example. If you know about, if you know MNIST, um, MNIST is kind of the, the hello world of almost all machine learning. Um, and it's also the hello world of deep learning. MNIST is a, a collection of 60,000 uh, grayscale images. Uh, they're 28 by 28 large. So tiny. <coughs> and they have handwritten numbers. And then the whole idea is to recognize handwritten numbers for the number that they are. So it's zero through nine. Um, when you do a torch chart deep learning model, uh, you derive your, you, there are two things you can do. And one is sort of a, a, a handy pattern for, for very simple things. But essentially you do the same thing that you would do in PyTorch, which is you derive a model uh, from this module uh, class, which is a, a base class for all models. And then all models and also all components of models are also modules. So if we have 2D, two-dimensional convolution, for example, or linear, which is the, the old, oldest um, deep learning or neural network construct, which is a, essentially a vector or a matrix multiplication. Um, these layers say how many you know, input uh, the input size and the output size, input size, output size. And we want 10 here because we're, in the end, we're going to come up with an estimate of, you know, or a prediction of 10, uh, you know, zero through nine. So 10 is the output of this whole thing. Anyway, so we, we have some pooling, we have some activation layers and activation layers are meant to sit between other layers and reduce the risk of, um, risk of uh, gradient degeneration, either gradient explosion or gradient uh, implosion, if you will, when the gradients get so small that they're effectively zero or they're infinite. Uh, dropout, we, Lewis talked about, Lewis talked about um, overfitting and drop, dropout is a way to help with avoid overfitting. It's not a, it's not a magic, uh, magic bullet by any means, um, but it does help uh, manage uh, overfitting by essentially saying, I'm going to zero out 25% of my uh, results from a layer, particular layer or 50% from a layer. Anyway, so what you do is you, um, you declare all these uh, modules and you <clears throat> have a constructor for the model, you, you got to give it a name. That's just a, a, a torch thing. Um, you need to register all the components. That means that the runtime knows about these things. <clears throat> and that's important when you're saving and loading it later. And then this is the important thing. This is, we call it forward in torch sharp. It's, we don't have call operator overload in C sharp. So um, in Python, it's just a call function, which means that you can use, you don't have to say forward, you can just say con. But anyway, so you declare this forward function and that's where all the magic happens. That's where you pass the input data through all these layers. Uh, and then in the end, you have this log soft max, which is a regularizing thing. What it does is it makes sure that, well, soft max does, it makes sure that, you know, all your uh, output estimates add up to one. Um, so it re, Re, it normalizes it a little bit. So this is C-sharp. Um, I can show you, we also have this working just 
just fine in F sharp. If you're an F sharp fan, <coughs> it uh, it has exactly the same structure. We have uh, to make things a little bit prettier than in C sharp. In F sharp, we also have this forwarding operator that allows you to write uh, the model or the forward function as just sort of a, a chain or a pipeline of layers, which is what it is. Um, I think this is, you know, prettier than than the C-sharp style, but uh, it's a matter of taste whether to use this or not, of course. So to train a model like this, then you need a you need to do things. And, and Lewis was talking about the, you know, the train and test uh, data sets and that they're different. And he talked about it in the in the context of cross-validation, but you do want to do a consistent, you know, consistently do a um, continuously do a reevaluation of how your model is doing, and that's why you should be setting aside a test set. Um, <coughs> sometimes you actually set set aside a second test set, the validation test set that you use at the very end of training. But in this particular example, we're just doing a train and a test set. So the these two functions then will operate on uh, on those two different data sets, and they're slightly different. Uh, during train, during training, you're actually going to we're actually going to be computing uh, gradients of functions in the neural network, which are then used for the backward propagation, which is where the actual training happens. Whereas in the testing, we don't care about the gradients. We're not going to be training there. We're just going to evaluate, which means using the forward function. And so uh, it's simpler, and it also avoids using a lot of memory, which, you know, the backward saving, you have to ha actually have to save data in a lot of uh, instances on the way, just so that you can do the back propagation. And that takes, that puts a lot of pressure on memory. So anyway, uh, the runtime has two modes, eval mode and train mode, and it's important to uh, know which one you're doing. So inside, inside this train um, loop, you um, get your data, and it's split up in mini batches, which is, in this case, I think we're doing like 64 records and images at a time. Um, you clearly optimize it, so that it's kind of like setting, setting a, something to zero at the beginning. You compute the output of the model. You figure out numerically how different that is from what you expected it to be. So the prediction and the target is your labels. Um, so now you have a, a measure, and it's a, it's a scalar. It's a single value. You have a measure of how good this model is. <clears throat> you then rely on that to uh, do the backward propagation of gradients. And you uh, step the optimizer. Not all optimizers actually do anything in step. It's a no-op in, in some of the simpler ones. But it adjusts some of the internal uh, variables of the optimizer. And, then we just sort of loop around, and this is this is it. This is the train. This is what would be called fit in many cases, right? Um, and the only thing that varies from you know from um, from situation to situation is you know what does the data look like, and what does the uh, loss function look like? And so those are things that we pass in. One thing I want to highlight here is GC collect. You don't see that a lot in .NET code, but one of the challenges with .NET as a numerical language, particularly one that uses CPUs, is that garbage collection um, actually <clears throat> needs to happen much more frequently than, <clears throat> uh, than you think. The issue here is that we're actually using native memory. So we're allocating for every tensor, and, and that includes a lot of temporaries in those math, in those, you know, that math code I showed you. Every single tensor is allocated as native memory, and so when the garbage collector is running to see, or the you know dot, the managed memory system is running to see if there's you know too much there's too much memory pressure, and maybe the garbage collector should be involved. It only sees the memory that it's been allocating in native in managed code, so it doesn't have an accurate picture of actually how much memory has been allocated. And in a in a training situation in particular. Almost all of the memory that you're using is going to be in native code. 
While we're on this topic, Nicholas, we do have a very a relevant question for, for this section uh, yeah. to address. So, so Fuel Snobel asked, um, so how does that help with the native memory? How does the GC Collect help with uh, the native memory? Yes, so uh, so what it, it does is for the things that, so, so it will go and it will uh, invoke the garbage collector on, on uh, before it would otherwise be uh, invoked. And a lot of the temporaries that are used uh, will be garbage collect, will be found to be garbage and will be collected at that point. Um, and, and it gets worse because when you're running this on a, on a GPU and, and GPUs have really just have physical memory and not much virtual memory, right? Then you will run out of memory very quickly because of all those temporaries that don't get garbage collected. So Python doesn't have as much of a problem as .NET with this because Python is, uh, generally speaking, uh, relying on uh, reference counting. So as soon as something is no longer uh, in use, it will be uh, its memory will be removed. Uh, whereas relying on garbage collection really blows things up uh, very quickly. I couldn't on most things. I can't go th get through one epoch even before it blows up with if I'm running on GPU. And it's because of all those temporaries. Yeah, and, and I guess as a follow up, uh, Fuel ask. Um, there's an API call at GC that add memory pressure. Uh, is there a reason hmm. why that wouldn't work? Um, it's this is simple. Hmm. I found this to be uh, I found this to be uh, simple. It it could potentially be built into the library itself, and uh, do the add memory pressure in there. And and that's certainly something that we can and should look into. I think that's a good. Now that I now that it's brought up, I think that's a good idea. Um, I'll I'll uh, I'll make a note of that and and see if that if the experience after doing that makes this makes this go away. Um, I but this was simple. So but it's an excellent point, and and I will definitely uh, take a look at whether that can can address this in a more uh, opaque way so so um, we're this took longer than I thought <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry for that we only have four minutes left um, I I want to encourage you to go look this is all code that you can find in the github repo uh, I encourage you to go take a look at that I go encourage you to go and file issues against that repo uh, with your suggestions and uh, whether they're style suggestions or whether they are just like feature suggestions, uh, things like that garbage collection thing, like, hey, that's that's a great thing to suggest and, and, and those types of things. I love it. Um, and then I encourage you to, uh, to take it for a test run. The examples are all there. Uh, it should be, the examples at least should be uh, self-explanatory, but, um, there's also a discussion forum on the on the GitHub repo that um, that I encourage you to take part in, and uh, I'd hope to look at a little bit more code here, but we're running out in we're running out of time, and uh, I'll just uh, I'll just stop here. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, there's a there, yeah. There's a few questions and comments. Um, one is around I guess how do you see this? So you kind of mentioned that you know as opposed to say something like like these other frameworks where you have some sort of fit uh, method or function that gives you this model. You don't really have that with Torch Sharp. So when it comes to visu visualizing these tensors and these operations and these models, um, is there a way that you can do that with something like, like Netron, right? Like how would you go about A, saving your state uh, and then visualizing what your model looks like once you, you know, train it? Yeah, so, so one of the challenges, if we look at PyTorch, um, and and that that whole uh, way of doing things is that there's no graph. There's a graph during uh, the backward prop, the backward propagation, but there's no graph. The forward function you, it is the same thing in in PyTorch. You define the um, you define the forward function, and that is the logic of your network. 
So there's no graph, unlike you know, TensorFlow, for example, or Onyx, um, which you can extract the PyTorch model to an Onyx model. And so it's hard to visualize the, the graph itself because, um, yeah, Seth is right. It's stored in the tensors doing, using back pointers, that, but it's usually thrown away after each, after each um, round trip. Um, so, so anyway, it's, it's challenging and it's not part of the model. And you can put in any arbitrary Python code in, in the forward function you want. Um, so that complicates things. You, there are you know, lots of things you can do. It's very, very flexible and very, very uh, useful from that, expressive from that perspective. So that's one thing. Um, and, um, but I do imagine that we will be using, we will rationalize a lot of these things and make them um, more like, like, like add layers on top, just like FastAI has done for PyTorch. Um, and uh, it's just not something that we will do as part of Torch Sharp itself. It'll be just like in the Python Torch ecosystem. It'll be you know an add an added thing. And and I I imagine that the right thing for us to do there is to do that in the context of model builder and ML.net. Yeah, there's another comment here uh, from Fuel also to, to sort of highlight. You kind of showed that some examples in F Sharp, but you know, going back to that discussion where it might be controversial uh, that the Tor Sharp APIs don't really look very .NET like. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that .NET includes F Sharp and VB, so uh, you know you can see some F Sharp idioms in in some of that Tor Sharp code. Yeah, um, we Don Syme and I uh, agreed on on this in the end. I, and you can go and look at, at GitHub on the issues and follow the whole thread. We, we conducted that discussion um, publicly. Yeah. So if you want to uh, look back on where uh, Don uh, sort of cited on that fuel, make sure to check out those discussions. Yep. Yep. OK. I, yes. Sorry, go ahead. I have a meeting with my boss. Yes, <laughs> definitely need to attend that. Uh, so thank you, folks. Hopefully uh, you got to learn a little bit more about Torchar from Nicholas. Uh, make sure to check out the repo. Uh, the link is there uh, on the screen. So make sure to check it out, provide suggestions, try it out, uh, and, and provide feedback as you try it out. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Nicholas, for joining us again and, and talking to folks about this. Yeah, and and uh, so how does Python solve circular dependencies with ref counting? It doesn't. There's a second. Python at least used to have a sec actual garbage collector to deal with that, but um, anyway, I will uh, I will continue to uh, look for feedback and input on the GitHub repo. That's where we really want to interact with uh, people for right now. And um, yeah, awesome. see you guys. Thank Thanks you so for much. listening. Take care. Yep. Bye. Bye bye.